video. Okay. Welcome back to our last session for today. We are going to learn about sea turtles. I brought my sea turtle friend here. And we are going to talk with um, Lucas Mears, who you saw this morning if you tuned in at 11 in some of the manatee videos. And we are gonna watch more videos like the ones this morning from The Science Of, but these will involve Lucas and sea turtles. And then he will be available to answer questions between each video segment, sort of like we did this morning with Dr. Jerry Pinto. And if you missed any of the prior um, sessions that we've done so far, they're all available online, so you can go back after the fact and watch those as many times as you like. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna switch over. There you are, Lucas. Hello. Hello. So Lucas, can you tell us a bit about where you work and what your position is and how you got there? Sure, of course. Uh, so like Melinda said, my name is Lucas Mears and I am currently the conservation program officer at the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens. And what that means is I kind of have a weird job. It's kind of blend of a bunch of stuff, um, but half of my time is actually spent uh, doing all the conservation work and working with our conservation partners, protecting animals, plants, and ecosystems around the world, uh, both marine and terrestrial. So that means in water and on land. Um, and we also do work with some bird species, so in the air too. Uh, and then the other half of my job is with the Okapi Conservation Project. Uh, and that we work to save the endangered Okapi, which is a relative of the giraffe. Uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, but I think what we're gonna learn a little bit about today, sea turtles, it's a passion of mine on the side. It's actually not part of my job. I guess in a way it is a little bit, but started as kind of like a, a passion project and interest mine. Uh, a decade ago this year, I've been working with sea turtles uh, every summer for the past 10 years. Uh, and then when I started working at the zoo, uh, JU, Jacksonville University, reached out to me because that's where I graduated from in marine science uh, to do a series of videos that have to do with conservation of uh, native species in Florida. So part of those, some of those were manatees uh, and some of those are sea turtles, which we're going to watch those videos today. Fabulous. Should we get started? We got a bunch of these videos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Eight or so to get through. Are we watching all of them today? We're going to try. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Our, uh, our session this morning <laughs> ran almost two hours, so you've got a lot to uh, beat that. So here, holy we're cannoli! Okay. Yes. Well, we had Dr. <laughs> Pinto and Dr. McCarthy. Um, all right. So I'm going to start part one, and we're going to watch this first: the science of video on sea turtles. I'm Lucas Mears, marine science graduate at Jacksonville University and conservation program officer at the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens. For six years, I've been walking the beaches of Northeast Florida, looking for and marking sea turtle nests. And recently, I spent a summer in Tortuguero, Costa Rica, working with the Sea Turtle Conservancy. Join us as we learn about the conservation efforts that are allowing this group of threatened and endangered animals to make a comeback. We travel to Gainesville to discuss the Endangered Species Act and threats to sea turtles with the executive director of the Sea Turtle Conservancy. At the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in Jacksonville, we discuss the statewide nesting program with a wildlife biologist. And then we bring you on Turtle Patrol with volunteers in Ponte Vedra Beach to search for sea turtle nests and share in the delight of rescuing baby sea turtles. And join Pip on her incredible journey as she grows up travels vast distances, and comes back to the beach she hatched on to start a new generation. And finally, learn what you can do to help these vulnerable animals make a comeback. Oh my gosh, was that it?
Florida's soft sands and warm waters provide some of the most important habitat in the world for five species of sea turtles. The leatherback, the largest and most ancient of the species, green, which are mainly vegetarians, hawksbill, whose beautiful shell has been prized for centuries, Kemp's Ridley, the rarest and smallest species, and the loggerhead, the most common species in Florida. At the Sea Turtle Conservancy in Gainesville, Florida, I caught up with David Godfrey to talk turtles. You know, there, we're seeing right now in Florida and, and in other places in the United States, um, the, some very encouraging trends in turtle population numbers. So last year, for example, was a record year uh, for green turtle nesting in this state. That began with the Endangered Species Act. And when all species of sea turtles were included under federal protection by the Endangered Species Act in the mid 1970s, that made it so that you couldn't go out and harvest turtles for consumption. You couldn't go out and take their shells anymore. You couldn't use them for meat. Um, and, and at that time, I mean, turtles were on the menu everywhere green turtles in particular. Through the ages, sea turtles have been killed for just about everything you can think of. The beautiful shell of the hawksbill led to their downfall. This confiscated turtle was stuffed to be a wall ornament. And using their shell for jewelry is where the tortoiseshell style came from. These boots were made from turtle flippers. Even the oils from turtle fat were used in face cream. So the passage of, of the Endangered Species Act stopped our direct harvesting of them and gave them a fighting chance. Since that time, a lot of work has been done to um, change human behavior, um, to protect important nesting sites, to identify other sources of mortality, like interactions with commercial fisheries, in particular shrimp trawls, and things like our behavior on the beach at night, you know, uh, lighting up the beach with our homes and condos. Um, we've learned a lot about the things that we do that harm these animals and, and protecting them really began with that Endangered Species Act. Now let's explore shrimp trawls and turtle excluder devices. Since sea turtles must surface to breathe air, they easily drown when caught in nets, unable to reach the surface. When nets are outfitted with turtle excluder devices, sea turtles and other animals can be shuttled out of the net instead of dying as bycatch. Most shrimp trawls in the southeastern U.S. are required to use turtle excluder devices, but not all do. Let's see it in action. The shrimp trawl scours the coastal bottom. A sea turtle has been captured, where it will drown if it does not get out. Instead of getting trapped in the end of the net, it gets pushed up against the bars, allowing it to use the escape hatch. By increasing the use of these devices, as well as modifications to longline fishing, more sea turtles will live another day. Back on land, a different type of innovative solution is turtle-safe lighting. Traditional lighting is prevalent on Florida's coasts and can distract and disorient sea turtles, leading to injury and death. Turtle safe lights, however, use longer wavelengths of lights in the red-orange spectrum and have little effect on sea turtles, allowing their natural instincts to be fulfilled. This business is one of many that has made the switch to turtle safe lights. Now that we see how turtle excluder devices and turtle safe lights can make significant impacts, let's explore just how important nests are in conservation efforts. Okay, Lucas, we're back with you after seeing parts one and part two. How are you doing? You've got a different backdrop now. Yes, <laughs> I did have to move into a different room to have a little bit better internet connection. You're coming through crystal clear now. So were you surprised to learn or did you, maybe you didn't learn, maybe you already knew it, that um, sea turtles at one point had been such a prevalent um, menu item? Uh, that was one of the things that I did learn. I knew that they were uh, on some restaurant menus, but I did not know to what 
uh, extreme it was. Uh, they were canned turtles, and it, 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 was a, it was a regular delicacy in the early 1900s. Um, and that was something that I did learn when I was uh, with David. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a bit older than you, and um, I grew up in the South, and, and I knew of one restaurant in New Orleans that was famous for their turtle soup, um, but mm -hmm. it wasn't very common even when I was a kid, um, so yeah. I, I'm surprised it was that prevalent. Um, I yeah. do, when I, yeah, go ahead. I know that sometimes there, there is turtle soup on menus in restaurants now, but it's not made with sea turtles. I think commonly it's made with snapping turtles. Ah, oh, that's a good point. Maybe that's with the restaurant yeah. in New Orleans. That would make a yeah. lot more sense, I think. I have New actually Orleans. had snapping turtle, not at a restaurant, but oh, <laughs> at a cookout that I had with a, a bunch of friends when I was growing up a long time ago. Wow. But Okay. But yeah. um, we don't have many questions yet. We've got a lot of people that are excited, that love sea turtles, that are excited you're mm -hmm. on, and a lot of people that are saying that people need to turn their lights off on the beach to avoid sea turtle deaths. Yep. Particularly yep. true where we are, or at least where I am, this time mm -hmm. of year, because it is net, ch net hatching season. Yes. So um, I said that all wrong. Yes. Nest hatching nest season. Nest hatching season. Yeah, so on our section of beach, um, that I help monitor the four miles in uh, Ponte Vedra, Michler's Landing Turtle Patrol. Um, we just had our first two nest emergences yesterday, or three days ago, and then they did the evaluations last night. And so what we typically do, and you'll learn this later on in the videos, right. is that um, after the nest emerges, the, the majority of sea turtles emerge from the nest, then we go in three days later because sometimes they don't all emerge at once. Mm -hmm. So there might be successive emergences on following nights. So we want to make sure they get out of the nest as naturally as possible. Then we go in and actually dig into the nest to count how many hatched and how many didn't hatch. But we're going to see all of that information explained later on. Yes. And I heard that um, two nights ago, one hatched in Atlantic Beach. I know we have a lot this time. Oh, excellent. Excellent. We have some questions. Are sea turtles endangered? Yes, yes, all species of sea turtles, all seven species of sea turtles around the world are listed as threatened or endangered. And there are five in Florida, um, and the most common being the loggerhead, um, but then we do have, uh, that is that one is listed as threatened. It still has the same protections as endangered sea turtles, uh, but those, um, those are as threatened to be just listed as threatened because their numbers are much more significant than the other species. Okay, and are any of them close to extinction, do you know? Um, the most endangered is the Kemp's Ridley, okay. um, and that's the smallest species of sea turtle. Uh, we occasionally, we might get one or two nests a year in the entire state of Florida, but they primarily nest on uh, one or two beaches in Texas and Mexico. And they're actually day nesters. They actually come out of the water during the day to lay their eggs as opposed to the other species of turtles which nest at night. Do you think that's why they're the most endangered? It could be. I'm not really um, sure how what what their threats are. If they have any particularly different threats as other species, uh -huh. um, but that could be an issue if they are spooked coming out of the water. Because that's primarily why you need to not have flashlights on the beach, mm -hmm. is because if a, if a female turtle is coming out to lay eggs, um, she can be spooked before she gets the chance to lay eggs, and then she'll go back in the water. Awesome. Okay, one more question and then we'll go on to part three. So someone asked how long you've worked with sea turtles. You said you've been doing turtle patrol for about 10 years? Yep, yep. I've been doing turtle patrol for about 10 years. Um, and one of those summers I was actually in uh, Costa Rica doing some research with the Sea Turtle Conservancy, that which you so learned. That is so cool. Yeah. Um, but yes, I've been monitoring the, the same stretch of beach uh, for four mile stretch of beach for the past 10 years. Wow, awesome. All right, we're gonna hop over to part three, okay? Okay. Thank you. Back at the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens where I work, I visited the FWC Field Lab to discuss the statewide nesting program in Florida. The purpose of our nesting survey programs uh, are to give us um, some information on how well the population is doing. This gives us a chance to count, actually, in the end, to count the numbers of mature females in, in a sea turtle population in Florida. 
the, when the sea turtles come up to nest on the beach, they have to drag big, heavy bodies across uh, soft uh, sand, and they leave very easy to see tracks. And the tracks are even identifiable to species. So a loggerhead leaves a different track than a green turtle, a different track than a leatherback. So you can go along the beach in the morning and look at tracks, identify what species they're from, and by looking at the characteristics of the track and any digging that's been done, tell whether the turtle nested or not. So if you do this on all the beaches in Florida every day during the nesting season, you can actually determine how many nests loggerheads made, how many nests green turtles made, how many nests leatherbacks made. And so each year you can see what the total number of nests are. And over the years you can see if those are increasing or decreasing. Alan showed me nesting data that can be found at the FWC website. You can see here in the late 80s uh, to mid 90s, the numbers each year were going up. There was a period here where they were going down for about 10 years and there was a lot of worry. Um, and there's a lot of different potential reasons for that, but the good news is that they're going up again. Without these and other data, we would not understand that loggerhead sea turtles are increasing in number and that green turtles just had a record year. So how does FWC obtain these data? This is a huge undertaking that goes uh, throughout all of Florida. This is covering all the sandy beaches of Florida for a pretty long period of the year, say early spring to late fall, to um, count all the nests by all the species in all areas of Florida. So from Pensacola to Key West to Jacksonville, people are out counting. In Northeast Florida, it's really all the sandy beaches. Um, Northeast Florida has about 150 miles of sandy beach that all have to be surveyed. There are about 17 different groups that, um, that do those surveys in Florida, so it's a total of about 500 associated personnel, and they provide summary data, the overall kind of picture of the data to the state so that we can put that together to look at, at what the numbers are statewide. Okay, so we, we got a bunch of questions coming in, but some of them, so one person asked how the populations are doing, but I think your that last clip kind of answered that mm -hmm. um, for the most part. And, and I honestly, I don't know if you know every single species because you know the ones we have in Florida. Yep. You know, I mean, so you said that um, the Ridley is not doing so well, but are most of the others doing better? Yeah, the, the Ridley is, uh, I, I don't know how it's doing um, overall, but I know that it, it is the most endangered out of, or okay. it is one of the most endangered. Um, but the, I know the loggerhead and green turtles have had a significant increase in Florida over the past two years. I think this video was made in 2016. Right. Um, and the, vid the footage that we were showing has the data all the way through 2015. Um, and I know that on our beach uh, in 2018, we had an insane number of, of turtles. Um, no, 2019, it was last year, we had the insane number of turtles. It was normally on our four mile stretch of beach, we get about 100 nests, give or 80 to 100 nests. Um, but in 2019, last year, we had 150 plus nests on our beach. So it was a 50% increase in nests from our previous record year. Any idea why? No one really knows. Um, all of this is really short term data, especially because sea turtles have uh, uh, a sexual maturity very late in life. Um, they're usually in their teens um, when they reach sexual maturity. It's kind of teens to 20s. Um, it's sometimes hard to tell any trends. So we have to look at the trends over several years at a time, mm -hmm. not year to year. Mm -hmm. um, and so overall population seems to be trending upward, um, slowly upward, but it does fluctuate from year to year, it goes up and down. So someone asked, how long do sea turtles live? So if they don't reach sexual maturity until they're teenagers, then I would guess they have pretty long lives. Yeah, yeah. yes, so pretty long lives. Um, and it varies by species. Um, and it's not 150 years like you know in, uh, that you hear in Finding Nemo, um, but typically around 75 years is how long a, a loggerhead turtle will live. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, and then somebody said, do you think that turtles will do better because of COVID? And I'm gonna jump in here because I live on the beach <laughs> and I'm gonna say, so they were insinuating that because of COVID, fewer people are going to the beach and so the turtles would do better. <laughs> and I would say there are more people going to the beach because they think it's safe to be mm -hmm. outside, but I, I'll get I your agree. opinion on that, yeah? I would agree, I would agree. Um, and I think we, we noticed uh, some 
uh, a, a thing on our beach because th there are a lot more people on the beach now. Uh, and as um, I'm sure many people know that Florida is becoming an epicenter of COVID and everyone is spending as much time outside as possible. Um, there was on July 4th for Independence Day, there was a significant much higher number of fireworks on the beach, mm. which is technically illegal, but it's hard to enforce when it's that that amount. Work, yeah. um, and it's the fireworks and just the presence of people on the beach at night. Um, that's what really um, uh, deters turtles from nesting. And so when I came, because I walk every Sunday, uh, and so July 4th was on a Saturday, so I walked the next morning, and we didn't have, uh, we had a few false crawls, which means they come out of the water and then go back into the water, and they oh, do no. not nest. Um, but we did have, uh, there were no nests that night on our stretch of beach. Um, I'm sure there were nests throughout Florida, but on our four-mile stretch of beach, we didn't have any. Uh, we just had a few false crawls. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'm gonna go mm -hmm. to part four. And some of you that are asking questions that I might not be getting to, it's because I'm pretty confident that they're gonna be answered in the upcoming videos. So yeah. so somebody asked, and again, I don't expect you to know everything about <laughs> all turtles, right? But do you know if um, there are more uh, nests on the Gulf Coast or on the Atlantic side of Florida? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so then we getting, we're getting into the question of ratio and the length of beach. And so then we need to look at nesting density and I'm not really sure. I know in the, in the kind of the armpit of Florida, the little um, bow curve, there's not really sandy beach for them to nest. So that takes out a significant chunk of shoreline that they can't necessarily nest. Um, but I do know on the Atlantic side, particularly in South Florida, and there's a few hot spots, and I think uh, there is a map on FWC that you can look at with the nesting densities. Um, there so are it that's Florida Fish and Wildlife for people that don't Correct. know, and Correct. and we'll have um, a Florida Fish and Wildlife expert on with us Friday morning. So thank you yep. for that segue. Sorry, so and you were saying they have a map on there. FWC.com. Okay. Huh? They have a they have a map of the nest sites on Correct. online. Yeah, and the density of them. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, we are going to jump to part four. Thank you, Lucas. We'll be no right problem. back. As Alan mentioned, there are about 150 miles of sandy beaches in Northeast Florida, and they provide important nesting grounds for these ancient creatures. Let's head to the beach to learn about these nests. About a month ago, a loggerhead sea turtle emerged from the ocean, trekked up the sand, and settled at a spot near the dunes where she laid perhaps 100 eggs. Just a foot below the surface of the sand, the eggs are developing into baby sea turtles. If all goes well, in about a month, the turtles will hatch and climb out in a flurry of tiny flippers and head immediately toward the ocean, using the reflection of the moonlight on the water as their guide. In just last year, over 1,300 loggerhead nests were laid on beaches of Northeast Florida. Every morning during the nesting season, groups of volunteers are out in force on turtle patrol. Caitlin, Stephanie, and I are part of a group of about 45 people that monitor four miles of sand around Michler's Landing in Ponte Vedra Beach, just south of Jacksonville. We search the beach for new nests and check the previous nests to see if anything has changed. Maybe a nest got predated by a dog, a crab, or was infested with fire ants. We're sure to note any subtle changes to paint an accurate picture of what happens to each nest. So far this season, we've been walking for 15 weeks. 88 nests have been documented as we near the end of the nesting season. Okay, so this is at 45 days. Uh, we're gonna need to do green tape. From years and years of data, we know loggerhead turtle nests generally hatch or emerge between 50 and 60 days. So, when we approach a nest that's been incubating for 45 days, we'll mark it with green tape to remind us to keep an extra close watch for the next few days. 
After hatchlings emerge from the nest, there are telltale signs. Like miniature tractors rolling over the sand, turtle hatchlings make subtle impressions. A whole slew of tracks are seen stemming from a central location, a depression located in the center of the marked nest where the baby sea turtles emerged the night before. We document the emergence and take photos to help paint the picture of what's happened to the nest, such as whether crabs or fire ants have invaded the nest. We clear the debris in front of the emergence area in case any other turtles emerge on successive nights. Three days later, another team excavated this nest and found many empty shells and discovered that those tracks came from 87 young turtles. Okay, we're back. So that was great. That was really interesting. And mm -hmm. um, the questions are, are pouring in. Can turtles get COVID? <laughs> um, there have been no documented cases of turtles getting COVID that I am aware of yet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that since our dogs and cats, which are also mammals, can't even get it, that the ability yeah. of a virus <laughs> to jump over to a sea turtle is rare. But that, that's um, a big jump. that would be a big leap. Um, so if someone asked when is nesting season, some of these questions are so general, it's gonna depend on the sea yeah. turtle and Worry. where, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it depends, it definitely depends on the species and um, where you are in the world. Some sea turtles, um, particularly in the tropics, nest with the moon phases, um, but here in Florida, they nest um, during the summer. And so uh, turtle season is May through October in Florida. And generally, the leatherback sea turtles will nest earlier in the season. Sometimes we'll actually get a nest or two leatherback nests in March or April. Those are really, really early nests. Then the loggerheads start coming in mid-May, at least in North Florida, because Florida has such a long coastline. It, even these are generalizations that shift depending on where you are in Florida, too. But in, in North Florida, um, the loggerheads will start nesting in middle of May all the way through, give or take, August. And then the green turtles um, will start nesting in July through September. And so they kind of come in waves. And it's really exciting when you get the first nest of the species and you know that they're going to start coming now and then you start to look out for them. Um, but again, that's in North Florida, and those are just generalizations. Sometimes we get a green turtle nest much earlier in the season. Sometimes we get a loggerhead nest much later in the season. And it, it all depends on where you are in the species and even the individual turtle, too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, one more question, and then we'll go to our part five. I think we're moving right along. So mm -hmm. someone, and I'm assuming they got this from Finding Nemo, is wondering <laughs> whether turtles travel with currents, which I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know if it's quite like Finding Nemo, but do you mm -hmm. know? Um, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know why they, I don't know why they wouldn't travel with currents is what I'm trying to say. It would because save it energy, would, it would right? Save, save energy, exactly. And um, animals need to save as much energy as possible, um, particularly, I imagine, if um, they're trying to use energy to produce eggs. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the female will do is um, she will go just stay right off shore uh, and she'll feed offshore during the nesting season and she'll um, mate and then it takes about two weeks to actually produce eggs uh, and then she'll come up and lay eggs and then she'll go back and then mate and then another two weeks and so she could a loggerhead can nest up to six times in a season wow. and that's every two to three years i had no and idea so it varies again by species to species but for loggerheads um it's pretty frequent that's amazing i thought it was once a year mm -hmm. well that shows what i know <laughs> okay. Well, I love this. I'm learning so much. Um, and I do know, if, for those of you that are, are interested in, in trying to figure out on your own, I mean, of course, you can do your own internet search, but there's um, some great organizations that do turtle tracking. They put tags mm -hmm. on them, like Osearch puts tags on dorsals, but instead yep. they use little vests, and sometimes they, mm -hmm. they may even glue them to the shell, but I think they usually use little yep. vests, and you yep. can track where the turtles go mm -hmm. um, and seasonality, so that might be something yeah. people want to right look up. Right now, um, sea turtle concern which is um, the organization that David Godfrey's with. Uh -huh. um, they're running what they call Tour de Turtles, right. where they actually track the turtles. They put the satellite device on it, and then the turtles, they make it look like a race to see which species always 
travel farther. Hint, it's always the leatherback turtles. Um, <gasps> I can't believe you gave that away. <laughs> uh, it's almost always the leatherback turtles because they're the big oceanic voyager turtles. Um, but yeah, they're doing their own tracking called Tour to Turtles and it's on their website. I think their website is conserveturtles.org. The leatherbacks check that out. can handle pretty cold water too, can't they? Yep, 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 yep. Um, they, and they're the big open water. They feed on jellyfish. Typically, open water tends to be a little bit colder. They dive really far into the water, and that's when the, where the, the colder temperatures typically are. But you typically find them around uh, the tropics. Interesting. Very in the cool. deep water in the tropics. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to cut to our next video clip, and we'll be right back. This is nest 44, which was laid eight weeks ago. Hatchlings emerged three nights ago, right on schedule. It is now time for us to excavate this nest to obtain data for the FWC and to save any hatchlings that might be trapped. As I dig, I'm careful, gently feeling for any differences in the texture of the sand. I can feel that I've reached the first hurdles. The limpness of their bodies tells me they are dead. Dead turtle after dead turtle is pulled out of the egg chamber and passed to Caitlin to get counted. The smell is horrible. Death permeates the air. I'm only getting dead hatchlings. The lineup of the dead hatchlings is growing. Sometimes things go wrong with nests and the turtles don't make it. They hatched, but why didn't they emerge from the nest? I didn't see any fire ants or crabs, so I wonder if being trapped in the sand caused them to be cooked by the hot sun. Okay, so I reached a big section of the eggs. So the turtles actually hatched and actually went above the eggs and they were trying to get out, but couldn't. So that explains why I'm just now getting to the eggshells because the eggshells were actually below the hatchlings. turtle. So right here we have a loggerhead hatchling. This guy is barely moving, but you can still clearly tell that he is alive. Some slight movement, but he's very weak. He's been trapped down there for <laughs> a few days, actually, with all of his brothers and or sisters. We put the freed hatchling in a bucket that serves as a holding area until it is released. And not long after. Here's another live hatchling. Uh, he's a little bit more active than his sibling. Um, so we're actually gonna put him in the bucket to join his sibling. By counting the number of eggshells, we can determine the number of hatchlings that made it out on their own. This nest had 85 dead turtles, making it one of the least successful nests of the season in terms of hatchling survival. While it is difficult to see all of these dead hatchlings, knowing that they are sources of nutrients for the ecosystem puts it into proper perspective. By placing the dead turtles and eggshells back in the nest, we allow nature to take its course. 95 eggshells have been counted. So with the 85 dead hatchlings and the two sea turtles we saved today, we determined that only eight turtles had emerged from the nest on their own. Now rescued, these two turtles receive a helping hand to make it to the next step in life's journey. Come on, little guy. Some need a little encouragement.
Okay, so Lucas, when I was a kid, and we've already clarified that I'm much older than you. No, so I in the early <laughs> in the that early much. 80s, my um, essentially my godmother was in charge of Turtle Patrol on Amelia Island, which is just north of Jacksonville. I and didn't back, know that. Yeah, and back then, <laughs> Pam Sultan, she was great. She's probably why I'm a marine scientist today. Um, but back then, you could drive on all the beaches, and so mm -hmm. we would go up out and we would dig up the nests and we would put them in buckets of sand in her garage and wait for them to hatch mm -hmm. and then we would go out and release them and back then they didn't know that the temperature within the nest impacted mm -hmm. the gender of the sea turtles now we know that now we've stopped driving on most of the beaches so that it's safe to leave them there um, but now climate change is uh happening right a lot of places are mm -hmm. getting warmer and so people, um, we've got a lot of smart people making comments. They were aware of the temperature of the nest impacting gender, but they're interested on what you know about climate change impacting gender. Yeah, definitely. So um, with, I'm sure there is going to be some impact. Um, climate change is impacting them uh, significantly. Um, there is some, some theories that as the uh, temperature increases that um, the, the turtles will start nesting farther north. Um, and I think they are seeing some nests that are farther north up the Atlantic coast of the United States. Um, and so as they continue to um, go farther, I think if it's the, um, if they are, uh, if turtles incubate, incubate below um, a certain temperature, they'll be male. But if they incubate above a certain temperature, they'll be female. I think it's um, hot chicks, cool dudes is how I remember that. <laughs> That's um, awesome. And so it's an easy way to, to remember yeah. it. But um, I, I do think as the temperatures start rising, um, not only will the turtles start nesting further and further north along the coast on sandy beaches, but they will tend to trend toward female. Um, but also with climate change, we have rising oceans, so that's affecting their nesting habitat. Uh, gotcha. And so I know along our stretch of beach, we have with uh, the significant impact of hurricanes recently in the past few years, um, a lot of um, homeowners along the coast are building seawalls and seawalls are known to reduce the uh, success of nesting sea turtles. So they'll more likely be washed out from the rising tides. Um, and so that's a that's another concern that we're dealing with with climate change. But yes, well, I do expect it to affect gender. It's too soon to know anything yet because climate change is very long term, right. many, many years, kind of the same thing where we need to look at trends in nesting tur sea turtle nesting data over many, many years at a time. Um, we need to do that the same with climate change and uh, gender gender studies. And I correct me if I'm wrong, all sea turtles return to nest um, at the beach that they were born, is that correct? Generally, generally. Um, and so I think we say that in one of the videos, I don't know if it's been in one of the previous ones yet, but generally, yes. Okay. I mean, they're not gonna necessarily nest on the same 500 feet stretch of yeah. beach. Okay. But within several miles, we're talking like 50, 100 miles or so, okay. they'll nest in the same region and demographic. And we've learned that there's specific um, genetic differences between different populations. Uh -huh. And so there was one study that I read a few years ago where um, a lot of the turtles on Northeast Florida beaches are genetically similar to a lot of the turtles that are in the Panhandle. Um, and then the turtles in South Florida on both coasts are genetically similar. So it might have something to do with the, the magnetism and the specific latitude, um, but there's still, there's a bunch of studies that are trying to figure that out. Yeah, to see. they're um, cool studies. I've read about yeah. a few of them. Yeah. Um, okay, I keep getting a question about, okay, hairs and turtle mouths. Do you know anything yes, about? Yes, yes, yes. Can you tell us about um, those? They're not necessarily hairs. So what they are are they're very soft spines. And that's typically seen primarily in leatherback sea turtles because their main diet is jellyfish. And so jellyfish, if you've ever... I'm not encouraging this, but I actually touched some today. So jellyfish <laughs> in the ocean, they can be really slimy. Uh -huh. um, if you ever see any on the beach, um, they are really slimy. And so that kind of keeps the jellyfish from coming back out of their mouth. But if you were to actually touch those spines, uh, they're not sharp at all. Um, they're actually very gelatinous. They're pretty soft. Do you know what they're made of? Um, that I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. 
I don't know what they're made of. I gotta, I'm, I have to look that we'll up. We'll have to look it up. That's okay. We yeah. don't expect you to answer every single question <laughs> about every turtle on Earth. Um, one other question that came up earlier was, um, and, and it was sort of answered in this video, which is why I didn't ask it when the person originally posted it, but they wanted to know how many eggs are laid in a nest. And I'm assuming that again mm -hmm. varies by species. Yep, yep, um, yep, definitely varies by species. Um, so green turtles and loggerheads, and these are again generalizations, green turtles and loggerheads will lay generally between 100 and 125, 115 maybe eggs per nest. Um, and I've noticed um, at least my experience that slowly decreases throughout the the season. I don't know if the, the, the female turtles run out of run out of energy stuff to make <laughs> yeah. eggs. Um, I know hawksbill turtles. Uh, when I was working with a few of those in Costa Rica, they lay. There were some nests that laid 185 eggs wow. in a nest, uh, and then leather, leatherbacks will be about 75 to 80 eggs per nest. And again, that's a generalization. Some might have 60, some might have 90. It all depends on the, the specific turtle and what time in the season they're less laying, le laying eggs. Gotcha. Okay, let's go in for another video. Are you ready? Yep. It's October, and we have a few turtle enthusiasts joining us. This is Nest 78, the last nest my team will excavate this season. We have excavated five nests since the dreaded death pit, and we're hoping we'll end the season on a high note. I worry that the hard, compact sand made it too difficult for hatchlings to make it out, and I brace myself for another nest of dead sea turtles. But there, a nose of a hatchling peeking out. I'm gonna slowly dig it out. I'm trying not to injure it. He's having trouble getting out because the, the sand is really compact from all the waves washing over. I'll let him get out by himself. <laughs> ah, he's so cute. Oh, I see there's another hatchling. So this one I'm gonna put in the bucket. then encounter a turtle covered in fire ants. Yeah. This guy is really weak, but he's still alive. If we had not liberated these trapped hatchlings from the compacted nest, fire ants may have eaten them. We quickly rinse her off in the ocean before putting her in the holding bucket. I got another turtle too. He's struggling, but he's doing it. There he goes. Look at that. Yeah, there we go. So far, all of the hatchlings we have encountered have been alive. He's a mover and a shaker. Yeah, he's really active. We have 10 hatchlings in the bucket. Here, we encounter a turtle partially in its shell. We call this a pip. This pip and the rest of the turtles we liberated bring our count to a total of 15 live hatchlings. One dead hatchling, okay. We take the bucket of turtles a few feet down the beach to release the hatchlings. To double check our number of freed turtles, we count them one by one until the bucket is empty.
Some of these hatchlings have weak flippers. Sometimes we see this when the sand is really compact, like we saw on this nest. And so some hatchlings are slow moving and struggle to move forward. Others are active and move straight toward the water. Under the watchful eye of the volunteers, all these rescued hatchlings make it safely to the ocean. We know only one to two turtles out of every 1,000 make it to adulthood. This year, on just this four-mile stretch of beach, our data shows 7,700 baby sea turtles made it out of their nests. Maybe, just maybe, 15 of those will become magnificent adults. Maybe even this one. Seven thousand seven hundred baby sea turtles. That's amazing. Yes, that was just on our stretch of beach. <laughs> but and I hate to make the the audience gets really sad when they see the baby sea turtles in those videos, and, and I hate to make them more sad. A lot of those are going to be eaten, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's that's part of the strategy of why the sea turtles lay so many eggs and nest so many times in a season is they're increasing the chances of their young to survive. So there's a few different strategies in the animal kingdom. Um, generally speaking, again, some animals will lay a lot of eggs or have a lot of babies at once and then not take care of them or just let them fend for themselves to hopefully increase the chances of survival. And others like humans or elephants or rhinos, any of the bigger animals with longer gestation periods or time of being pregnant, um, they'll <laughs> devote a lot of time and energy into creating the offspring. And then they'll actually take care of the offspring for a long time to ensure its chance of survival. Um, so those are two different kind of strategies in the animal kingdom and the sea turtles and, and they need to, well, I don't, I don't want this to come across as bad, but I mean, they, they do provide a lot of food for the other animals in the food web. Yes. Um, and so it, it helps other animals to, to survive and breed right. as well. And so those, those adult sea turtles, the ones that hopefully get excluded by the mm -hmm. turtle exclusion devices on mm -hmm. the nets that we saw in the beginning, those are not to say that one turtle is more important than the other, but the older ones are super important because especially the once they've reached their teen years, right? Because those mm -hmm. are the ones that are the egg layers. Yes. And yep. so it's really yep. sad um, when one of the, the big ones gets, um, yep. gets killed. Um, mm -hmm. So more climate change questions, and I felt like you <laughs> sort of addressed this earlier, but um, someone was asking whether you thought or whether there's data showing that sea turtles may be um, basically a, a lot of organisms uh, with the climate heating up are, are m moving towards the poles, right? And so mm -hmm. people were wondering whether or not nest sites are going to be found um, in more northerly um, beaches in, in our yeah. hemisphere. Well, I, I, I definitely think that that will happen. And um, I'm not familiar with the nesting trends in um, states farther up the coast, like North Carolina. Um, I'm sure that they are starting to see some nests. Um, but one thing that we're noticing in Florida is we're noticing turtles nesting earlier in the season. So uh, one of the questions before or something I addressed was the nesting season in, in Florida is May through October, but we're seeing more and more nests in early May and even into late April. So there is some movement in Florida to m push the, the nesting time from April 15th through October 31st because they are starting to nest earlier because it is getting warmer earlier and earlier in the year. Interesting. Okay, and then somebody asked a question that I actually had earlier too when I went off on my tangent about my childhood of releasing <laughs> sea turtles. So somebody wondered why you guys don't actually put them closer to the water. And I remember when we released them, sometimes we'd actually put them right at the water's edge, mm -hmm. but you guys let yeah. them crawl a little bit. Yeah, and so, um, I uh, different strategies and protocols change as we learn new information because even now we don't we in Florida we very rarely relocate nests because our main purpose on the beach is to collect data right. 
um, understand what is actually happening with as little human interference as possible. Mm -hmm. um, because they're, they are nesting, their numbers are trending upwards. So we're trying to see what is actually happening. What's the impact of the building of a seawall or climate change, the increase in temperatures, that sort of thing. Um, so what we want to do is um, give them as natural a, of an experience as possible. And so just like if they would hatch out naturally on their own and they would crawl all the way to the water, we want them to crawl all the way to the water. And there's some theories that say that it's working out their muscles. Some people think that the, they're imprinting the beach on them, on themselves. Um, there's a, a few different theories around that. Okay. Uh, and so we just want to maintain uh, a, as natural of an experience as possible. Because again, our main purpose is just to collect the nesting data to understand what's actually happening. So you're not just mean, you don't like to watch the baby sea turtle stuff. <laughs> no, we do every time we, we do a release and there's people around that I, we get that question all the time. I bet. But, and, and it's a good question. It's a good question. Why wouldn't you want to help them? Um, and yeah, we do. I don't think that we're supposed to even necessarily protect the ones that are in the nest that we released the two or three or 10 or 15, however many there were before. Um, I, we're, we're really not supposed to interfere if birds were to start feeding on them. But I think th that that's when our empathy, our hearts get to us and we do provide a little bit of protection. That, that would be very <laughs> yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that would be hard for me to watch. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'm gonna cut to the next clip. Um, so someone said, I believe one out of a thousand hatchlings will actually survive to adulthood. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, we estimate one to two, and that number is, is again, an estimation. So we really don't know, there's not much being done with understanding adult turtle populations, because again, we, we're primarily working with nesting females we're not working with male turtles. So what we're estimating, so there's a whole demographic of the sea turtle population that we're really not working with. There are some organizations that are working with male turtles and in water where they actually dive into the water and catch the turtles and actually pull them up and put satellite tags and stuff on them. Um, but that we get that estimation, the one to two per every thousand from the number of nests that are laid on the beach versus the number of sea turtle, the young hatchlings that hatch. Okay. And so that's how we calculate that one to two every 1,000. And so we take into consideration the formula of the species can nest up to six times in one season every two to three years. We take that into account to get an idea, a rough idea of how many adults are in the population. And then we essentially divide that by, or divide the number of, I don't know how the don't do works. math on the screen. But, yeah, that, that doesn't work do well for anyone. <laughs> um, but we, we look at that, that the estimated number of adults versus the number of hatchlings come out of the of each nest. OK. And that's how we get that generalization number. Great. All right. We're going to watch. I think we got two more video clips left. Yep. Only three inches long, young Pip faces many hungry predators in her new world. By instinct not fully understood by scientists, Pip swims toward her new home many miles offshore in the Sargasso Sea. The Sargassum seaweed provides important cover from predators. And the increase of Sargassum seaweed also means an increase in food. She will spend the next 10 or so years of her life growing up to three feet long and 200 pounds. Now with her increased size, her only natural predators are large sharks. Pip will now travel the long journey back toward the beach from which she came. How she knows where to go and how to get there is not fully understood, but researchers have shown that loggerhead turtles respond to the Earth's magnetic field. She's not the only turtle to have made the long journey and she, along with other turtles, will spend the next 20 years growing into an adult in a relatively shallow area along the coast. Now, at reproductive age, she finds a suitable mate. About two weeks later, Pip emerges from the ocean she has called home for the past 30 years to dig her first nest. 
there she lays upwards of 100 eggs to begin the next generation of sea turtles. Pip then returns to the shallows where she will mate up to six more times, depositing hundreds and hundreds of eggs by the end of the summer. After 50 to 60 days, the turtles are fully developed and begin to hatch from their leathery, golf ball-sized eggs. The hatchlings will wait below the surface of the sand until the temperature drops, signaling nightfall. Under the cover of darkness, when their predators are less active, they will emerge from the nest and make their trek to the ocean. Those that escape their predators will swim to the Sargasso Sea, just as Pip did 30 years before. A journey that has been repeated by countless generations of loggerheads. All right, Lucas, I know that you're donating, volunteering your time to us while you're on vacation, so I don't want to keep you too long. Um, oh, and no worries. I'm happy to be here. Someone wanted to know whether you've seen Turtle the Incredible Journey. Have you seen that? I have not seen that. I have not either. I have to look it up. Yeah, we'll do that later. That was actually the only question that popped up, so I'm going to go ahead really? and... Okay. Um, go to our last video and then so any of you that have questions type them up now we're going to watch our last video and then we're going to let lucas go in the next 10 minutes or so so he can go back to his vacation um, <laughs> all right so hang with me for a second Long before humans first set foot on these beaches, they provided essential nesting habitat for sea turtles. And all sea turtles that nest here on this beach started out here as hatchlings years ago. They are true locals and instinct brings them back here year after year. It is our duty to be good stewards to this habitat. And fortunately, there are easy things that you can do to help reduce our impact on sea turtles. Don't litter. Not only is it unsightly, but it can kill turtles of all sizes. Trash like this can entangle hatchlings when they emerge from the nest. And many times, turtles can mistake our trash as food. A lot of different plastics have been found in the stomachs of sea turtles, including plastic bags. And remember, trash on the sidewalks and in the streets eventually end up in the ocean. If you live or work directly on the coast, use turtle safe lighting. Incorrect lighting can repel females from nesting and disorient hatchlings from going to the ocean, leading to their deaths. If you see a sea turtle or a nest, enjoy watching it, but make sure not to disturb it. Just let it do its thing. If you see a dead or injured sea turtle or someone disturbing a nest or a sea turtle, dial star FWC on your cell phone to report it. You can purchase a sea turtle license plate. Proceeds from this specialty plate go to fund grants for conservation, research, and education, and is the main source of funding for the FWC Marine Turtle Protection Program. Volunteer to be a citizen scientist or just tag along with the Turtle Patrol team. That's how most of us get our start. Thanks again for joining us, and next time that you're on the beach, be sure to look out for our ancient friends on the beach and in the water. For more videos and information on sea turtle conservation and other sciencey topics with a Northeast Florida focus, visit us at thescienceof.ju.edu. I love that you guys wrap that back up with things that we can do so we can be proactive. Mm -hmm. And um, I do want to say we've shown a lot of video clips, although people are sticking with us and seem to love it. There's two other um, sea turtle uh, videos that Andy Willett made uh, on the Science of website that I'm not mm -hmm. showing today. I had to reel it in a little bit. I wanted to show them all. <laughs> but um, again, we can't stay here through dinner, depending on where you guys are watching this from. I'm getting hungry. Um, but we got a really great question uh, for you, Lucas, and okay. it actually is not necessarily about turtles. And I want to restate that you're 
your job is not sea turtles. You volunteer Correct. your time. So can Correct. you say again, in case somebody tuned in, where you work, what you do, and then the, this person wanted to know your favorite part of your job. And it doesn't have okay. to be marine related. If you want to talk <laughs> about your trip to Africa, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I work as the conservation program officer at the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens. And there my time is actually spent um, 20 hour, about 20 hours a week, although I'm sure I put in more, um, uh, working with all of our conservation partners around the world, saving animals, plants, and ecosystems everywhere. And the other half of my job is working with the Okapi Conservation Project that works to protect the endangered Okapi in Africa. Um, and I'll say my favorite part of the job and my favorite part of sea turtle stuff. I'll do two. Okay. Um, so my favorite part of the job in uh, conservation in general is actually working with people because a lot of pretty much everything in conservation is working with people. You're only gonna be successful in conservation if you're working with people because nature can survive without people, but people really can't survive without nature. And it's trying to find that, I don't wanna say that balance between the two because people are a, can be a part of nature I think people forget that often. Um, and I think my favorite part is just working with people and educating people and teaching them about animals and plants and ecosystems and what they can do to help. Uh, and then I would say my favorite part of working with sea turtles is the very rare opportunity to actually see the hatchlings emerge all at once. And that's something that's happened three times in the past 10 years of doing work with sea turtles. Um, volunteering on the side and it's only about one or two days a week that I do it um, but I've been lucky to see it three times in my life and that is a, a high uh, high frequency among a lot of us it's very rare to actually see uh, hatchling turtles come out all at once I've seen the one or two or few that come out when we're doing the surveys but actually to see it happen naturally is is kind of a, a really incredible experience Wow. Well, now I realize how lucky I am. And, and I know that those were kind of artificial, but I've also yeah. once caught them um, hatching yeah. in front of our house in Atlantic Beach. So the best the best story I'm going to add. Yeah, a story to please. This. The best story. It was uh, my wife and I, we walked because we used to live on the beach, very close to the beach, about three blocks. And there's the, the beaches town center yes. um, in Atlantic and Neptune Beach. Which, so yeah, isn't the there. center of any town. It's I, the edges I, of both. It, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and we walked up there to get ice cream. And then we decide it's getting dark. So we're going to walk back on the beach to walk back to our house. And as we're eating our ice cream, I see all this activity around a sea nest, a bunch of people crowding around. Um, and I realized that there were... The, the sand started to bubble because the sand will bubble yeah, yeah. Um, and start to move in the nest. Uh, and so my sea turtle brain kicked in and I had everyone turn off their flashlights and turn off the flashes on their cell phones. They couldn't be in front of the turtles. I basically did a, a little education with them. There were about 50 or 60 people. Wow. And that's a lot of people, a lot of people. To, to control, um, not to say control, but to educate all at once. Well, hundred sea turtles going out to the beach and you want to make sure that no one's stepping on them because it's really dark. Um, but that was just a total coincidence that we were just walking back with our ice cream and happened to stumble upon it. And it was, it was a, it was a really cool experience. That's an awesome story. And we're getting all of the comments now. They've switched from questions to tell Lucas, I said, thank you for all he does. Um, tell Lucas, thank you. Lots of thank yous and appreciation. So, and I also well, want to thank you again. You're on your vacation. You're not getting paid for this. Uh, well, all of our experts are doing it for free, but they weren't yeah. all on vacation. Um, so I really appreciate it. I'm going to go it. out to the beach after this call. But I also want to say thank you for giving me this opportunity because, again, I said part of my favorite, my favorite part of my job is talking to people on on what they can do to protect the animals and plants and ecosystems around us. And I really hope everyone learns something from this today, um, I or did. at least one tip or trick that you can do to help do your part to help save sea turtles. And a, a lot of the strategies to help save sea turtles help other animals and plants and eco ecosystems around the world. So right. reducing your plastic consumption, avoiding plastic bags, bring your reusable bag to the grocery store, one-time use, single-use bottled water, avoid using that, bring your refillable water bottle. Um, just little things like that, uh, all decisions that we make can actually make an impact on the world around us. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, for all of you, I'm going to say goodbye to Lucas. Thank you. Bye. I'll be Thanks in touch. so much, Melinda. Bye. Thanks, Brandy. I know you're in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, everyone else. Let's see. Uh, 
Okay, thank you everybody that stuck through to the end today. We had a lot of material today and we've got great stuff tomorrow. So we have two Oster uh, presentations, one at 11 a.m. and one at 1 p.m. Um, th that schedule may have been incorrect on the camp website. It was supposed to be fixed today, but I'm not sure if it did. So again, for O-Search, um, 11 a.m. and then a different O-Search presentation at 1 p.m. And then at 3 p.m., we have um, two wonderful people from minorities and shark science. So they'll be talking at 3. And then tune in on Friday if you want to hear about more uh, marine science careers that you may not know about. We have a physical oceanographer. We have someone from the Army Corps of Engineers. We have someone from FWC, uh, which is Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, oh, and we have um, someone that works in conservation um, for Crowley on the West Coast, Dan Smith. And then we've got a presentation by Crowley and a presentation by Jacksport in the afternoon. So get your shark fix tomorrow, and then on Friday we'll learn more about marine science careers. Thanks, you guys. And if you missed any material today, remember, or, or on Tuesday and Wednesday. It's all been recorded and it's available to watch after the fact.